good day. This series of videos describes Niagara's Welland Canal, a fun place to watch ships up close. In this part, we talk about the canal from a ship's perspective and about locks and bridges. Let's get started. On Lake Ontario, west of the canal entrance, there's an anchorage, a parking lot for ships where they can anchor while they kill time before their next appointment. The anchorage can get crowded near the end of the shipping season. There's a similar anchorage at the Lake Erie end. When ships approach the Welland Canal from Lake Ontario, they use the range lights to follow the safe channel into Port Weller Harbour. Range lights consist of a front light low to the ground and a back light higher up. When the lights are lined up, the ship is on the safe path. Lake Erie also has range lights. Once within the canal channel, buoys mark the ship channel, green on the east side and red on the west. At night, the buoys have green or red flashing lights. In addition, the west shore is lit up by white street lights. Through St. Catharines, the ship channel hugs the west shore, so there is no need for red buoys. To recognize and utilize navigational markers like leading lights and channel buoys, commercial ships are required to have both the navigation charts and the sailing directions for the canal. In addition, ships are required to have two-way VHF radios to talk to seaway management and other ships. There are other navigational gadgets. Satellite phones surface radar, AIS, which tracks ships' locations, and DIS, a bottom mapping and location system. Binoculars come in handy, but the magnetic compass and sextant and barometer have had their day. The speed limit in the canal is 7 miles per hour, and on the new section near Welland, 9 miles per hour. For comparison, these ships get up to 12 to 15 miles per hour on the open water. When navigating ships in a confined space, the tricky elements are the water current and the wind. The sailing directions describe the few locations prone to current. When a lock drains, there is briefly a stronger current in the canal downstream from the lock. Seaway management uses VHF radio to warn any impacted ships. To mitigate the prevailing west winds, shade trees are planted along many stretches. Various resources cross the canal's bottom. Pipes for utilities, car tunnels. These are marked on the navigational charts and with signs along the shoreline so ships don't drink anchor near them and break something. Along most of the canal, there is room for ships going in opposite directions to pass. There are a few pinch points where only one ship can fit at a time. Seaway management manages traffic to make sure ships pass at a safe place. Ships waiting for another ship to emerge from a lock often wait at a tie-up wall. Tie-up walls are located above and below most locks. Near other pinch points, such as bridges and former bridge locations, canal management might tell one ship to slow down to ensure that passing occurs at a safe location. Ships' horns are pretty loud if you are up close. If kids wave, the ship's captains often sound a salute. One long and two short. On rare foggy days, the ships in the anchorage hoot every minute or so. Beyond that, the ship captains rarely use boat whistles in favor of the VHF radio for ship-to-ship -ship communications. 
Setting cargo aside for the moment, ships need places to exchange things with the shore. This includes crew starting and ending their work rotation. It also includes people supplies such as food and laundry soap, full barrels and empty barrels. So Seaway Management has designated exchange points for unloading and loading things. The purpose of each lock is to raise and lower ships. To do this, there are a few steps. First, the ship approaches and enters the lock. Second, the ship moors to the lock wall. Third, the lock gates are closed. Fourth, to raise a ship, the upper lock filling valves are opened, so water can enter and slowly fills up chamber. To lower a ship, the lower lock draining valves are opened, so water can exit and slowly drains the lock chamber. When the water is at the right level, the lock gates open and the ship can leave and continue on its journey. So I'm going to break down each of these steps. The lock devices for this are huge but are mechanically simple, so they're fairly reliable. As a ship approaches a lock, there is a fixed procedure the ship follows to protect both the ship and the lock equipment. The ship slows down and creeps along the tie-up wall. At low speed, the ship crew can steer the front of the ship side to side using the bow thruster. When the lock is fully ready, the ship gets a green light and may pass the LA-1 sign. The ship follows the contour of the approach wall so that as it enters the lock, it is going very slowly, perhaps one foot per second. Near the lower gate, the gate at the north end of each lock, the arrestor boom arm lowers and drops the arrestor cable in place. This cable is part of an emergency ship braking system. It protects against the possibility that an out-of-control ship could ram and damage the lower lock gates. This is not necessary for the upper lock gates, because while the water is down in the lock, the upper lock gates cannot be reached by a ship in the lock. The, the lock wall obstructs the ship from reaching the upper gate. As the ship is entering the lock, you may hear the water trickling past the ship. It's actually rushing out. The ship is pushing it out. The water in the lock has to go somewhere. As the ship moves into the lock, two large illuminated signs, one at each end of the lock, indicate the distance in meters available in front of the ship. The ship proceeds at low speed until it completely enters the lock. Once the ship is stopped and the engines are off, the ship is moored to the lock wall. Typically, the automated vacuum mooring system is used. Six rectangular vacuum pads in three pairs extend from the lock wall and slurp onto the ship's side. These mooring pads prevent horizontal motion but travel vertically with the ship as it is raised or lowered. Some ships don't have large flat sides, so they still moor with the old-fashioned ropes, for example, pleasure boats and tall sailing ships. In those cases, the crew needs to draw in the mooring rope as the ship is raised in the lock, or if the ship is being lowered, the crew has to let out rope. In parallel with the mooring, the lock gates close. The lock gates are controlled by hydraulics, once the lock gates are closed and the mooring is complete, the valves are opened to fill or to drain the lock. Under each side of the lock is a large tunnel. A valve blocks water flow at each end of the tunnel. To raise the water, the filling valves located near the upper gates are opened and the water flows by gravity into the tunnels and then into the lock. To lower the water, the draining valves, 
located near the lower gates, are opened, and the water flows by gravity from the lock into the tunnels and out into the canal below the lock. There are no pumps required. Power is only needed to operate the valves. The valves they use, the shape of the valve, it's called a tainter valve. The English engineer Jeremiah Tainter settled on this shape because the water pressure does not have the effect of forcing the valve open or of forcing the valve closed. To fill the lock, there are four tainter valves. If all four tainter valves are used, a full speed fill is eight minutes. Let's talk about the twin flight locks. There are two lock fours, two lock fives, and two lock sixes that form two lanes. Southbound ships typically use the west lane, locks four west, five west, and six west. Northbound ships use the east lane, six east, five east, four east. The three locks in each lane are connected directly to each other, so they somewhat resemble a flight of stairs. That's how they got the label flight locks. All the locks in the system, all 11 locks, have similar dimensions and features, but some have distinctive features. For example, lock one has a gate that faces north into Lake Ontario. Most of the gates in the system face south because the water flows from south to north. Lock 7 has a sector gate, which has additional strength to deal with ice when the south portion of the canal freezes over in the winter. Lock 8 is longer than most locks. It has a vertical lift of only a few feet, has an arrestor cable at both ends, and has no vacuum mooring system. And it also has a lock gate that faces north. In addition to the two south-facing lock gates that all lock chambers need, some locks have extra redundant lock gates. Places ships stop. Ships obviously stop at locks. They might stop at tie-up walls where they, when they were told to by seaway management, but they don't load or unload anything at the tie-up wall. It's just a temporary stopping place for traffic control ships often stop are wharfs. There are 15 or so wharfs along the canal. Some are private and some are operated by seaway management. Ships load or unload cargo at these wharfs. In addition, some can be used for loading supplies like fuel, people supplies like food, specialist workers like electricians who can come on board and fix broken things during the eight hours it takes the ship to transit the canal. A few wharfs have their own specific function, like specific cargoes that are loaded or unloaded. I'll cover that during the virtual tour. There are three turning basins in the southern portion of the canal where medium-sized cargo ships can turn around. The turning basin near the paper mill is used regularly. Here are all the ways to cross the canal. I'm talking about bridges and skyways, tunnels, ferries. At lift bridges, ships have the right-of-way over road traffic and rail traffic. Seaway management lifts the bridge in plenty of time so the ships shouldn't need to do anything. If seaway management forgets and the ship gets to the bridge warning light, the ships use VHF radio to tell off who's ever on duty. Let's talk about the eight moving road bridges. These moving road bridges each have one or two sidewalks. Seaway management websites as a page that describes the availability of each bridge. When a bridge raises, there are three different alarms that sound. in a couple of minutes. If you could work yourself uh, behind the road gates, that'd be great. Thanks.
parallel, there are road signs that helpfully direct people around the closed bridge. There are five rolling bascule road bridges. A bascule bridge raises by pivoting on one end like a drawbridge. They're called rolling bridges, rolling bascule bridges, because they actually roll along a track on the ground. The axis of rotation moves laterally as the bridge opens. Most of the bridges have the counterweight up over the road and swings down to road level as the bridge opens. There are three vertical lift road bridges. The counterweights are housed in the tall towers at each end of the bridge. The clearance under each bridge is 40 yards above the water and so ships can be at most 39 yards high above the water line. Some ships have a folding mains mast because 39 yards just isn't tall enough. In the middle of the bridge itself, over the roadway, there is a two-story building. The upper story houses the machinery that lifts the bridge, so the bridge actually pulls itself up. The, motor, the motors don't pick up much weight. Counterweights balance things so that only a little upward force is required, like 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds. The lower story, formerly the bridgemaster's office, is no longer used as the bridges are all operated remotely. Some bridges have red and green traffic lights. The red indicates either the bridge is down or the bridge is up, but there's another ship coming the other way. Flashing red means the bridge is moving, and green indicates the bridge is up and the ship may proceed. That covers the eight movable road bridges. I think it's a credit to the canal designer's foresight that so much of the road infrastructure designed over a century ago is holding out under today's road volumes. Moving on, the Garden City Skyway is a fixed, high-level road bridge that carries the highway named the Queen Elizabeth Way, or QEW, over the canal. There are three tunnels under the Welland Canal, which all carry road traffic and a sidewalk. One of the three tunnels also carries rail traffic. So now I've mentioned rail traffic, let's talk about all the rail crossings. Besides the tunnel, the only other rail crossing is the double track CN main line near Lock 4. The rail line has two single leaf rolling bascule bridges. One bridge over the west ship lane and one bridge over the east ship lane. They are managed as two separate bridges and could be moved independently. So at any time one could be up and one could be down. There are some relics nearby, near this rail bridge. The relics are related to the third canal. There's an abandoned rail tunnel that runs under the third Welland Canal. This historic treasure is fenced off and inaccessible to the public. The only people that can get to it are the vandals. A second relic is the rail swing bridge that carries the CN main line over the abandoned third Welland Canal. It no longer swings, but it carries trains daily. It's in pretty good shape for 126 years old, even if it doesn't get around much anymore. Last way to cross the canal, there is a small seasonal ferry that carries people and bicycles across the canal at Port Robinson.
that's all I've got. Comments are welcome. Check out the other videos. Thanks for your time and I'll see you by the canal.